Well, hey, welcome back to 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church out of Tampa, Florida. My name is Joel Eason. I serve as the senior pastor at Bridgeway, and uh, it's a treat and honor for us to connect together uh, for this study in 316. Now, often we'll get people who are visiting for the first time with us on this study, and they'll ask, uh, what is 316 connected to, or why do we call it that? And uh, we're anchored into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed and it's useful. Some translations use profitable, but it's all valuable and useful for us, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that we might be equipped, so that the man of God, the woman of God, person trying to follow the Lord, will be thoroughly equipped for all that God's called them to do. And so we, we try and take an approach on these studies of walking through the Scripture at a, a very a much slower pace than might happen on a Sunday, uh, in that we want to go verse by verse quite often. And uh, for the Old Testament uh, prophets that we've been going through, we're doing more summary. We're not doing so much verse by verse. But if those verse-by-verse -verse kind of studies uh, are, are interest, interesting to you, if they uh, are helpful for you, we've gone through a high majority of the New Testament. You can find those on our page. Um, but for this study, we're going through the Old Testament prophets. We're looking at the major prophets in order to, in the fall, look at the minor prophets. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to our look. And uh, anytime that we're studying the prophets, it is advantageous to also think about, at least think about, if not study, the kings. Because when the kings were in place and they were doing well uh, for Israel, the people often followed the Lord and held to his practices. And priests did their job according to the Torah, according to the law of Moses. But when the kings were off, it was like this compass that would send the nation off. And so uh, you find that in the book of Judges that they really did as they saw fit in their own eyes. And it says they had no king, so they did what they wanted to do, basically. And God wanted to lead the people, but they were uh, very stubborn and kind of uh, stiff-necked, as some translations will say. So anytime you have the prophets being raised up to speak, calling people to return to the Lord, or the, the punishment that's coming, you can almost always do a parallel and watch the kings that were helping lead the people into that kind of um, digression. So uh, today we are going to be uh, looking at uh, Daniel uh, to close out the last of the major prophets. Now, when I say major prophets, it's because uh, there's more data around these prophets. So far, we have gone through Samuel, who is the first of the prophets. Samuel's an intriguing study that we did, uh, looking at him serving both as priest, as judge, and as prophet. Uh, scripture confirms this. Paul calls Samuel the first prophet. And then we went from him into Elijah and Elisha, once again, matching the kings that they uh, were living amongst. Uh, for Elijah, he is having to deal with um, King Ahab was the primary one. Uh, and then you get with Elisha, primarily Jehoram. And uh, we talked about, uh, talked about those when we studied them. Then we talked about uh, Isaiah and the four kings that were in place while he led. Uh, the primary one was Ahaz that uh, a lot of the passages are around. And then we talked about Jeremiah and Ezekiel last, and now we're closing out with Daniel. So um, I want to give just something that we've shown along the way as a little bit of Old Testament kind of history and kind of so we can see where the prophets kind of sit. That front section, certainly, you have out of the book of Genesis, pre-flood, post-flood, and then kind of the patriarchy of Abraham and the Israelites being formed as a nation. Then you have the bondage and conquest going from uh, Moses in Exodus. We see that uh, he is being raised up, and then they go into the promised land, and that extends all the way through Joshua into Judges, and uh, we see... That's when we have Samuel coming onto the scene as the as the last judge, first of the prophets. 
uh, but you had a united Israel. And so Samuel is the one that anoints King Saul to be king over Israel. He'll be the one that anoints David. But that's in that un united or unified kingdom, united Israel. And we read about that in 1 Samuel 11 all the way to 1 Kings 11. Then you get into division. Following the death of Solomon, you have Rehoboam, the split that happens between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. You have 10 tribes who, go, who govern northern, the northern portion of Israel. They came to be defined as Israel. In the southern portion, those two tribes came to be defined as Judah. And that's when you had a divided kingdom. Now, in that prophet era, uh, that's when those prophets began to speak because all, every single one, about 20 northern kings of Israel, all were wicked. About eight out of the, about eight out of 20 of the southern ones out of um, where Jerusalem would be, about eight of 20 did well, served the Lord. Uh, 12 led the people into you know a lot of apostasy and a lot of darkness and prophets were raised up so where you see in that purple section you would have Isaiah you would have Hosea you would have Micah you'd have uh, Joel Amos Obadiah you'd have Habakkuk uh, you'd have Zephaniah this is also where Jeremiah begins to speak and then you have exile and that's the captivity, not just of 722 from the Assyria, but primarily the Babylonian captivity. And uh, Jeremiah was both in the purple section and the red section. He watched the captivity happen, lived in Jerusalem through the whole thing. In the red portion, exile, you would have the prophets Ezekiel. You'd have Daniel, who we're looking at uh, today. And uh, you know, it's also where you get the book of Lamentations because Jeremiah is in Jerusalem watching the destruction of Jerusalem. And then you have restoration prophets coming from Babylon in back to the promised land. And uh, that's where you would get uh, guys like Haggai and Zechariah, Malachi. Uh, it's also the time period that you'd get Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther all in that orange section. And then that apocryphal period would be where you would have the Maccabees, and, and we won't be exploring that. Um, but I just want to, to highlight that Jeremiah, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, lived and prophesied amidst that uh, purple section and into the red section, and in the first deportation, we'll touch on this in just a little bit more, um, the first deportation of exiles, the first deportation of Jewish people out of Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, Ezekiel was amongst that first group, Daniel was amongst that first group, and so they're going to prophesy all the way over in, um, in Babylon. Um, so, uh, once again, the Samuel, it would be King Saul and King David with the opposing enemy being the Philistines. Elijah, you'd have King Ahab and then his son. Uh, and the prominent uh, enemy, the prominent threat, I should say, was Aram, which would be north, which would be modern-day Syria. Uh, same thing for Elisha with the same enemy, but you see the different kings. And I won't explore their all of those kings, you can listen to the previous studies. Uh, Isaiah, you had four, all coming from within one family. Jotham was Uzziah's son, Ahaz, Jotham's son, and then Hezekiah coming from the same family. Um, but you go ahead and go over to the kings of Jeremiah, and this sets us up for Daniel, because they were the same kings for Ezekiel and Daniel. Think about Jerusalem area, where Jeremiah was, Ezekiel and Daniel were in the same area. And um, we know from Ezekiel's study that he was 25 at the time. He will prophesy five years into being in Babylon at age 30. Uh, Daniel's a young man also. Uh, but they're dealing with these kings. Josiah was a good king, but he had a son that didn't do well, uh, Jehoaz. And, uh, and then we talked about this with Jeremiah. There was an alliance with Egypt, with the Egypt, the king of Egypt, who helped, uh, you have it, Jehoiakim, but his name originally was Eliakim, and as the king of Egypt deposes, helps overthrow Jehoaz, and this is crazy, but Jehoaz and Eliakim, Eliakim they're brothers, 
Eliakim comes into power, the king of Egypt changes his name to Jehoiakim, and he's the one that suffers the devastation, the first devastation from Babylon, which would be Ezekiel being deported, Daniel being deported. And then you'd have Jehoiachin. He was only in power for about three months. He was set up as a vassal city. Whenever you hear vassal city, think about a, a city that's left alone a bit. Just they can't rebuild a wall. They can't uh, rebuild an army and they pay taxes. It keeps them under the control of a dominating nation. Babylon comes into Judah area, uh, takes control basically, um, has Jehoiakim exiled, um, and then Jehoiachin is, um, um, is in power, but only for a short time. It, it does not go well for him. Zedekiah is put in place and then the final captivity because Zedekiah fought against the vassal city um, requirements. And you can read in Jeremiah, Jeremiah even tells Zedekiah, just do what Nebuchadnezzar is telling you to do. Zedekiah doesn't. He's going to end up dying um, in Babylon. He ends up being blinded with his kids being killed in front of him. It's a really gruesome story. Um, but I just point to Ezekiel and Daniel lived amongst these same kings. Now, uh, for Isaiah, he was a guy that was prophesying judgment is coming. Jeremiah was a prophet that prophesied judgment is here. and He lived amongst it. Ezekiel was in the judgment in the exile. He was in Babylon, and so was Daniel. But Daniel begins to prophesy about a kingdom coming, and so we're going to see some of that tonight. So if you take the book of Daniel and you were to break it down into two parts, the book of Daniel divides very easily. It's 12 chapters. It divides very easily. First six chapters are personal. The uh, next six chapters, chapter 7 through 12, are very prophetic. And it's interesting to see the chapter quantity of the major prophets because we've said this before, they're defined as major prophets because of the quantity of material that's around them. Um, Isaiah has 66 chapters, Jeremiah has 52, Ezekiel 48, but Daniel only has 12 chapters, and even the book of Hosea has more than that. Zechariah has 14 chapters. So it's interesting that you would that Daniel has historically been classified as a major prophet, and he should, because his prophecies, not only was he contemporary to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but his prophecies have so much content to New Testament, Book of Revelation, and the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, when Jesus is talking about end times. And we'll touch on that a little bit. So he well is well worth and fitting uh, to be considered one of the major prophets. Now, um, I want to push into chapter 1. We're going to read more out of chapter 1 than we do out of any of the other chapters um, and then we'll kind of do some summary as to what transpired for, um, for uh, Daniel. But I want you to continue to keep in mind before we, if I can just come back to something real quick. If you were to keep in mind, Jehoiakim is the ruler over Jerusalem. Let's just think Jerusalem. Um, when Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar come in and besiege Jerusalem, all of Judah, which is broader, bigger than just Jerusalem. And you have that first wave of exiles. There are going to be very selected people that are exiled. It's not just we're taking the worst out of the city. If you were Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonians, you're going to leave the worst in Jerusalem, in Judah. You're going to take the best with you because you want to put them into your service. And so... Daniel chapter 1 is going to immediately pick up on Jehoiakim, and it's going to talk about what I just kind of stated, that the best were taken. Uh, so think royal family, think the religious leaders around Jerusalem, or young men, you know, young men that could be trained. Remember from last one, Ezekiel was 25 in Jerusalem, and he is awaiting becoming a priest at age 30. Before he could be a priest, he is deported. But at age 25, these young men 
could begin to serve at the temple. We talked about that, showed the scripture out of the book of Numbers for that. At age 25, you could serve at the temple, but you weren't a priest yet. So keep that in mind as we read Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So chapter 1 is very contextual. Daniel chapter 1 is going to give you the context of what happened. And it says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Because God had been saying, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Finally, Jeremiah says, it's here. It's time. Along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Now, keep that red portion in mind. So, not only did they exile about 10,000 people, leaders, royal family type people, um, they also took some of the contents out of the temple. Okay, so just file that away in your thinking. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia. So they travel all the way from what would be Jerusalem to, let's call it modern day Iraq area, and put it in the treasure house of his God. Keep going. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, uh, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. That would be those priestly Priestly line or the people awaiting to become priests, people that had wisdom, people that knew the Jewish scriptures, people that um, were kind of, let's just say, on the elite status. Uh, they're not just grabbing some people off the street. So he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, has his official to gather some of these royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So Nebuchadnezzar brings people, this was a common practice, to exile people out of the town that he could use in Babylon. So in verse five, 4 and 5, he was to teach them, teach these young men, the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, I'm going to leave that up, but just pause for a second. You know the famous story, and Daniel's going to ask to reject the king's food and to have a different diet, and a lot of attention gets put on that portion of chapter 1. It's a fantastic portion. I'm not discounting that. I just want you to understand the historical context. 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar is going to be coming south from the Assyrian area. I'll talk about that in a second. He's going to take, he's going to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. He's going to take about 10,000. Ezekiel's in there. Daniel's in there. They're going to end up in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is going to ask for the best and the brightest to be trained for three years in language, literature, everything. So they would have had an exchange of literature. Just file this away for your own thinking later. If you've ever, and I'm going down just a short rabbit trail, if you've ever wondered in the New Testament, how did the proverbial quote-unquote wise men know about Jesus? What do they, they come to Herod and they say, we have seen the star, we have read of your scriptures, he's this Messiah to be born. Where, where, where did they get that stuff? Where did, where did they have the literature all the way in the east, which would have been the Babylonian area, these would have been Persians at the time, or, or from that Persian area, um, it would have been coming all the way back from these exiles. These exiles who would have also brought with them not only articles from the temple, but their literature also. So that connection of the wise men in the New Testament reaches all the way back to this exile that Ezekiel and Daniel were within. But um, I want you to understand that uh, there's going to be this putting them into service. And uh, then at the tail end of chapter 1, it says, At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in. So this would have been at the end of those three years. So three years have eclipsed. 
the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel and that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, that is, he's going to change their names. Uh, Belteshazzar is going to be Daniel, but Daniel continues to go by Daniel, even though Nebuchadnezzar continues to call him Belteshazzar. Hananiah and uh, Mishael and Azariah, that's where we're going to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those guys. It's just their Babylonian name. So they entered the king's service. And then it says in verse 20, In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. <laughs> so that's, that's really important, I think, when you look at the totality of the book of Daniel, that Daniel is this exile uh, who has come into this location and he is advanced. He's a smart guy. And he uh, has favor with Nebuchadnezzar and is able to excel beyond other leaders that Nebuchadnezzar has around him. Keep that in mind for just a second. The way chapter 1 ends says, And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, I'm just, I'll, I'll show this to you in a second, but King Cyrus is not, is not Babylonian. And he is not Medes, M-E-D-E-S. He's actually Persian. So you get the Medio-Persian Empire. So this is given context that he is going to be there in the fall of Babylon and he is there in the rise of the Medio Persian Empire. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a second too. Chapter one of Daniel is so contextual for establishing why he's there, what has put him kind of into a place of prominence, and how things are going to go. So just keep that in mind. So when you look at those first six chapters, chapter one, it's very personal. Chapter one is dealing with the deportation from Jerusalem to Babylon and the training they had. Now in chapter two, and we'll look at portions, in chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a dream and he's going to ask his wise men around him to tell him the dream and then interpret it and none of them are going to be able to. So Daniel's going to get called in and Daniel's going to be able to interpret it. And it has, it causes Daniel to have tremendous regard with Nebuchadnezzar. So this is just one snippet of the interpretation of the dream. And then I'll talk about it. The dream, this is Daniel interpreting it. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, you looked, O king. And there before you stood a large statue. You dreamt of a statue, a large statue. And you dreamt of this enormous, dazzling statue. He was awesome in appearance. So Daniel's defining to him what he dreamt. And then he's going to tell him what it means. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. And its chest and arms are of silver. Its belly, thighs, bronze, legs, iron, feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. I'm not going to read any more of that to you, but Daniel interprets what dream he had and the meaning of it. And each of those represents an empire. The head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian empire. Uh, the chest and arms uh, of silver, two portions, just keep that in mind, two portions is going to represent the Medio Persian Empire, two parts. The belly and thighs of bronze, it's going to represent the Greek Empire. And then the, the, the feet, legs and feet going down into the iron, uh, that represented uh, the Roman Empire. So he is defining to Nebuchadnezzar what this dream means. Now, this is interesting because. Daniel has already witnessed the conquering of a land. He's in exile. And he is telling Nebuchadnezzar, your land is going to be conquered. And Nebuchadnezzar does not reject him or oppose. He actually 
honors Daniel for interpreting the dream uh, correctly and, and telling him the truth. Now, keep that in mind in chapter 2. While in chapter 3, that's the famous story in which Nebuchadnezzar, prompted by his people around him, to build a massive structure to himself, a gold structure to himself. I personally think that Daniel would have watched the construction of this happen and thinking, what are you doing? You had this dream, this prophetic dream, and it doesn't go well for the statue. Why are you making a statue of yourself? But he does. He makes this very ornate, robust statue. You know the story. Uh, when the music starts, everybody's supposed to bow down. And um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. And you know the whole story. That happens in Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is going to have another dream. And this dream is going to be perplexing to him. It's going to be a dream about a tree and uh, there being great, um, great beauty and great blessing around this tree. It's enormous, but then it starts to crumble. It starts to ha be cursed and uh, things go terrible for this tree. Nebuchadnezzar is going to think, what is this? He's going to solicit uh, Daniel once again. And we read just a portion, Daniel chapter 4. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, and this is after uh, Daniel's interpreted it. It says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exult and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. All those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now pause here for just a second. Real important here. So once again, Nebuchadnezzar has a very prideful dream but a sobering dream because he sees it's he's he sees his own destruction coming daniel rightly interprets that the destruction is coming it causes it causes nebuchadnezzar to go through a period of almost insanity where he's pushing away but he's going to come back to just rectifying that uh he his kingdom is going to fall he's just a man and he's very humbled by this. It's interesting that um, Daniel's at the heart of that interpretation about here's what's coming. Now, the reason I push on this here is I wanted you to see how chapter 4 ends and how chapter 5 begins. So it's ending with, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 5 begins in verse 1, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. So what happens in chapter 5, Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Somewhere in time between chapter 4 and chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar has died. Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, is now the king of Babylon. And Daniel's still there. And Belshazzar is going to give a great banquet to himself with many people around. There's going to be all kinds of, um, you know, drunkenness and given to things that would be excess and, you know, debauchery, if you want to define it that way. And amidst this, there's going to be this real famous writing on the wall. I'll come back to this verse, but if I come back to chapter 5, He's got this festival, and there's a wall inscription that happens, a handwriting on the wall. Daniel is going to be the one that gives interpretation to what is being written on the wall here. And I think that it's important to also understand that amidst this drunken festival to himself, he had called for the items from original Jewish God's temple that were now in the temple of Babylon, he had called for those. And he is just giving himself to a high level of arrogance uh, above even his dad. And Daniel is going to have to prophesy to Belshazzar about his ruin. So keep that in mind then as you look at how Chapter 5 is going to end and go into chapter 6. So chapter 5 says, That very night, 
that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So this is well documented in history, not just from biblical history, how the Medes defeated the Babylonians in a night greatest kingdom in the world, and they are defeated in one night. There literally is coming under the breach of the wall around Babylon, which was this famous, massive, massive protective wall, but there was a breach to it. The Medes come under that area, and in the course of the night in the midst of this festival, Belshazzar is slain, and that quickly the Babylonians fall to the Medes. So Darius is the ruler of the Medes. Now if I come back to this, so that takes us then into chapter 6, because once again that's the end of chapter 5, right? Chapter 6 is going to then point to Darius and the Medes and the lion's den. So I'm going to come back to this in just a second. But so here's Daniel chapter 6. Now Daniel so distinguished himself amongst the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king, not Nebuchadnezzar, not Belshazzar, not Babylonians, Medes, Darius, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and satraps of the Medes tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were able, unable to do so. So they concoct this plan about prayer and make sure that nobody can pray because they know Daniel will pray, and that's where the lion's den story happens. I love the famous story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. love the famous story of the lion's den, but I'm also highly intrigued by the history around it, what led to it. The first six chapters of Daniel give the context of why he's even there in Babylon. He was taken from this first group, and while he's there, he is of high level of intelligence, high level of character, so much so with the favor of God on him that he is pulled into Nebuchadnezzar's service. He is used by God to interpret a dream and to tell Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom's going to fall. It's going to fall tragically. And uh, from that, there's going to be a second encounter where Daniel has to say that Nebuchadnezzar is going to die. His son, Belshazzar, is going to come into power. Daniel's going to have to speak against him, too, and say, God is going to rip the kingdom from you. That night, Belshazzar dies. The Medes conquer. And then David finds himself in favor with the Medes, a whole different class of, uh, of rulers and leaders. And it's that group of people that are going to try in that same area to try and have Daniel killed in the famous Lion's Den story. It's an amazing thing when you look at these six chapters, the hand of God upon this man that has given himself to the service of God. Now, before I show you what comes next, I want you just to keep in mind, pulling away from this all, it has been Daniel that has watched in, ba in Jerusalem. He has watched Jerusalem be besieged the first time, 605. He was in exile. He didn't see the final conquest of Jerusalem, but he saw his people fall to the Babylonians. While in Babylon, Babylon he saw Nebuchadnezzar die. He saw Belsh Belshazzar die, and the Babylonians fall to the Medes. But now... He also watched, don't miss this, please, chapter 1. Uh, let me scroll back up to it. You remember this verse? <coughs> Daniel remained there until the first year of the King Cyrus. Daniel watched the Medes have to align with the Persians because the Persians were coming in and more powerful. Cyrus was Persian. So he has watched, he has watched all these empires topple. He's watched God be glorious and stronger than all of them. And it's that context that then leads to the next section of the book of Daniel where it gets very prophetic. And it makes complete sense to me. 
from what Daniel has watched to why he's the one that God gives the visions to. Chapter 7, he's going to give him a vision of four beasts. And these four beasts are empires. It is Babylon. It is the Medio Persian Empire. It is the Greeks. It is the Romans. Keep in mind in Daniel chapter 2 of the vision of the statue, this ornate gold head, chest of silver, this bronze down at the thighs, legs of iron. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar, it's empires. You're all going to fall. He has a vision in chapter 7 that is reflective of that. In chapter 8, he's going to have a vision of two empires, a ram that has two horns. That would have been the Medes and the Persians, the Medio-Persian Empire. They're going to be destroyed by a four-horned goat. That is Greeks. If you think about Greece, where Greece is, what, what's the water right beside it? The Aegean Sea. Aegean, A-E-G-E-A-N, comes from uh, this, this uh, Greek word for A-I-X, or you can find it as E-G-S um, in different areas. But uh, it built out, you would find A-E-G-U-S, and it meant goat. It's what the Aegean Sea meant at its root, is goat. And so when he's prophesying of this goat with four horns, when Alexander the Great dies, very famous, beyond just biblical history, this is world history, when Alexander the Great dies, Greece was broken up, the Greek Empire was broken up into four quadrants. Down in Egypt, you had the Ptolemies. Over in the up in modern day Syria, you would have the Seleucids. Uh, you had two other areas. You had to have four areas. And Daniel is seeing this years, centuries ahead of time. Uh, in chapter nine, he's going to have a prayer of repentance on behalf of of uh, the people of God. But that also he begins to talk about the tribulation that's coming. This is so incredibly connected to Matthew 24 and 25, what's called the Olivet Discourse. The reason it's called the Olivet Discourse is because Jesus talks about the end times on the Mount of Olives. Olivet, Mount of Olives, Discourse, the end times. And it's also connected to Book of Revelation. You would get into Revelation chapter 6 to the eighteen. In Revelation, you have three categories of judgment unfolding. Seals, trumpets, bowls. And the 70 weeks happens within that sequence. And um, so he is seen prophetically. He's also in chapter 10, going to in 10, 11, and 12 are going to run together. Uh, he's going to see a vision of a man um, uh, and receiving angelic help. Uh, because he is, once again, if I go back to chapter 9, he has seen what's coming. So he begins to repent. You read this for yourself because we don't have time. But if you read what Daniel goes through in his prophecies, it's anguishing to him. It's exhausting to him. When he'd get a vision, he is laid out for days afterwards. And so he begins to repent. And in chapter 10, uh, you see the help of God. You, he's going to have encounter with Gabriel. He's also going to hear about the support and the help of Michael, two of the archangels of heaven. Uh, we don't have time to unpack all that. He's going to, in chapter 11, though, he's going to talk about kings of the north and south that are going to make war on Jerusalem and then the rise of Antichrist. Now, the reason I have natural and eschatological is that natural, these natural things happen for Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The Jewish people were released to go back by the Persians. They were released to go back to Jerusalem. There was rebuilding. That's where you would get Haggai and you would get Zechariah who were prophesying about rebuilding and the people of God and all of that. But there's also an eschatology and end times to this thing. And Daniel is used sovereignly to point not just what's going to naturally happen to the people of God, but this is divine in nature to be fulfilled at a later date. In chapter 12, he's going to deal with end days. Now, 
all of that, chapter 7 through 12, is so deep and so exhausting. No way to summarize that in one take. Uh, but he is, I just pull away from it and say it's, it's remarkable what Daniel went through contextually from Jerusalem to Babylon, what he watched with Nebuchadnezzar and the fall of Babylon to the Medes and then the alliance of the Medes to the Persians. And amidst all this, God uses him to prophesy about the sovereignty of God and the divine kingdom. Now, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple, two last things. Daniel chapter 12, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then, but at that time your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And one of the things you see in the last portion of Daniel is Daniel prophesies about a judgment day, not just for nations but for individuals. And he talks about resurrection and that we will be r r risen to account for life. It's a fascinating, fascinating prophecy, um, which was fulfilled naturally in some regards, but also has great fulfillment that awaits eschatologically. Now, I want to show you just this last thing. If you take, you know, Daniel as a whole, this is intriguing to me. Nebuchadnezzar's dad was Nebuchadnezzar, and he established, he is the one that established the Babylonian Empire. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the most famous, but his dad established it, and he ruled 626 B.C. to 605 B.C. Um, in 6, I think it was 612, something like 612, he goes up towards Assyria, and he's the one responsible for defeating the Assyrians um, and the end of that kingdom. He's going to die shortly thereafter, seven years later. He's going to die in 605 B.C. while on campaign, and his son's going to take over. And his son is going to come down south and besiege the Israelites in 605 B.C. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's name meant Nebu, protect my son. And Nebu was perceived in the ancient world as the god of writing and wisdom, of literature, which would be destiny and wisdom. He's the god of destiny. He's the god of wisdom. And may you protect my son. So, he, so Nebuchadnezzar grows up and rules looking for wisdom. That's why he's looking for people who are able to learn literature and able to understand things. It's rooted in his name. It's rooted in his dad's name and protect my son, the prayer for him. And it's fascinating to me that in the whole scheme of things, all these rulers and all these kingdoms that look to themselves in their own glory all fell. And Daniel has this very marked statement. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. Daniel is just a young guy who gave himself to the Lord and he's the one that's given to writing. He's the one that's given to wisdom to talk about the sovereignty and the majesty of God on high. And I know Daniel, although it's just 12 chapters, God, there's so much inside of the book of Daniel. And especially when we look back and we say from Samuel to Elijah and Elisha to Isaiah to Jeremiah to Ezekiel and now Daniel, it all points not to Israel. It all points not to other lands and nations. It points to God on high, who is sovereign and who we can give our lives entirely to. And, um, and so I hope this study of the prophets, I hope this study of these men of God has been beneficial to you. I hope you take it even further as you explore verse by verse at certain sections and areas and that the Lord would bless you. 
I want you to know it's been an honor to teach this short series uh, of these prophets. And in the fall, as I said earlier, we're going to get into the minor prophets. And we're going to deal with guys like Joel and Amos and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and all those guys. And uh, we'll learn about what God was speaking through them. So with that said, God bless you. And I look forward to seeing you soon.